Today, we're gonna tackle one of those highly debated questions in fitness. Is 800 calories a day unsafe? And I picked 800 on purpose because sometimes people say 1200 or 1500 and we're gonna get into these nuances, but I picked a really low number because the question comes up all the time given our cultural obsession with magic numbers, with universal thresholds and set points. We act like 800 or 1200 calories is the universal floor for women and 1500 for men. And that anything below that for everybody is automatically dangerous. But the reality is, as always, more nuanced than any arbitrary threshold, and it depends on context, constraints, and individuality. Let's talk about why this question about calorie levels and whether 800 calories or 1200 or whatever is unsafe even matters, right? It comes down to fitness culture. We're obsessed with magic solutions, formulas, the one best fit answer, right? The one thing, you know, you've probably heard again that women should never go below 1200 calories or men below 1500 calories. And these often get thrown around as if they're universal laws of physics, but they're completely arbitrary. Here's the reality. Okay, let's get into numbers. A sedentary 105 pound woman might only burn 1200 calories per day at rest. That is her total metabolism, not even RMR or BMR. We're talking about her total daily energy expenditure. Now, eating 800, even at that level, tends to be pushing it for most people. Doesn't mean it's unsafe. It depends on the deficit and how long you go. Compare that to on the other extreme, we have people that are 300 pound plus who might be burning 3000 calories at rest. A male, for example, who burns 3000 calories is not uncommon at all. Somebody who lifts weights. In fact, it doesn't have to be 300 pounds. It could be 225, 250 burning that much. So for him, 800 calories, an actual intake of 800 would represent a massive, ridiculous, extreme, yes, unsafe deficit. It would be like 70, 75%. So when we talk about very low calorie diets, and defining our terms. There's actually a term, very low calorie diets, right? VLCDs, and they are actually defined as 800 calories a day or less. These are not like lifestyle diets. These aren't rapid fat loss phases. They are clinical interventions, typically under medical supervision for people who have severe obesity or diabetes. I think the problem comes when the commercial, highly marketed weight loss programs take a number like that and then they give you the food, Optavia, anyone, they give you processed bars and shakes, they send it to your door, they tell you not to exercise, and then they send you away for months at a time and like, good luck. Well, we know how that ends. That ends with crash and burn, and even if you lose the weight, you're gonna gain it all back because you don't know how to sustain that. So let's address the elephant in the room, metabolic adaptation. I want to contrast metabolic adaptation with terms like metabolic damage or starvation mode that are used by people to claim that, you know, either aggressive deficits are harmful and permanently so, or that you are permanently harmed because of something you did in the past. And I'm sorry, but we're gonna have to fix that. And here's my special protocol to do it. The truth is more nuanced and also more empowering, I would say, in that metabolic adaptation, look at the word adapt, Adapt is something that is flexible, right? It can, it can adapt one way and then it could adapt back. It's a real thing, it's a real phenomenon where when you eat less, your metabolic rate decreases beyond what you'd expect just from losing weight. So if you're losing weight, if you're in a deficit, the fact that you weigh less is gonna burn less, fewer calories, yes. But beyond that, your metabolism goes down due to what's called metabolic adaptation. It's kind of a protective mechanism. It's an efficiency mechanism. I guess the, the silver lining of that is that an aggressive deficit, in some ways, it's reversible. And because the time is short, the reversibility is also short. But if you go aggressive for a long time, then that's where the problem comes in. You're not gonna permanently damage your metabolism, which is the thing that gets sensationalized. I like to think like an engineer, right? Every diet involves trade-offs between three main factors, the speed of your results, the sustainability of the process, and I'll say preserving your metabolism. The three things that are gonna get impacted the most when you do a diet and how you can optimize. So you can optimize for speed and you can go very aggressive with a deficit, but you're gonna sacrifice sustainability and that's where you have to keep the time shorter. You're gonna increase the risk of muscle loss if you don't. You're gonna increase the risk of severe metabolic adaptation. So that's one thing. You could also optimize for how sustainable it is, how much you can adhere to it by making it more conservative. But of course your progress is going to be slow. And then you can optimize for preserving your metabolism by going at a reasonable level of aggressiveness, but also having diet breaks and refeeds. And that's gonna extend your timeline. You're not actually on the net increasing your metabolism. 
you're just taking breaks along the way and it's gonna take longer, but it's gonna feel more sustainable while still being somewhat aggressive, if that makes sense. So the key here is to understand these trade-offs and then to choose intentionally, consciously, not accidentally falling into usually what's an extreme approach. Let's talk about biofeedback for a second because that's another thing I had in my notes here that is extremely helpful as a guide. We fixate a lot on numbers and when it comes down to it, numbers like your expenditure, like how many calories you have to hit, like your macros are just starting to scratch the surface, right? What's really below all of that is what's in your body. It's your biofeedback. It's the constant information that you get about whether your approach is actually working or you're pushing too hard. Now it's hard for many people to read those signals when they first do this because they're so screwed up. They're so misaligned and miscalibrated from years of doing this the wrong way. And that's okay. When you start to do things intentionally, you also start to regulate your biofeedback signals, your energy levels, your sleep, sleep quality, your strength in the gym, your recovery, your hunger, your mood, all of that starts to get more regulated and then therefore more trustworthy. If So it's kind of a chicken and egg, right? So it, that's why it helps to not be pushing anything too hard initially, to not be in a diet and to let things regulate while you're improving your sustainability. Now, the beauty of biofeedback is it is completely personalized to you. By definition, right? The more petite woman eating 1200 calories, she might have excellent biofeedback being in this moderate deficit and the, the weight just comes off, no problem. Done with the diet, moves out. But then you got that bigger man, let's say the 200 pound man, he's eating 1800 calories, might, might show warning size. For me, my biofeedback can fluctuate. And so that's another more advanced way to handle those signals in that you can push sometimes and pull back other times. So regardless of your calorie target, two factors are critical that we've mentioned already, and that is protein and resistance training because you wanna preserve muscle during a deficit, the range being about 0 0.7 to one gram per pound of body weight for protein, and then resistance training is a whole topic for another time, but I am shocked that programs will would discourage exercise because that is setting you up for poor body composition outcomes. Don't do it. There's no reason for that whatsoever. Even if you're eating very low calories, maintaining those priorities of training and protein is going to dramatically improve your results and reduce the negative 